Welcome to the podcast. I'm Angela Bobier, and this is Life in the Talbot Settlement, brought to you by Tircano Heritage Society and Bacchus Page House Museum. In this series, we will do our best to give you a full appreciation of the history of Western Algon County in southwestern Ontario, from First Nations through the original European settlers to the 1950s. I'll cover one topic per episode, with the first eight setting the tone for who we are, where we are, and what we do here at Bacchus Page House Museum. Please follow us on all social media by searching at Bacchus Page House, spelt B-A-C-K-U-S, P-A-G-E-H-O-U-S-E. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. Welcome to episode 22 in our podcast. Thank you to board member and chair of the West Elgin Genealogical and Historical Committee, Colin McGugan, for providing all the research. Colin has been transcribing the census records of Dunwich Township, now the municipality of Dutton Dunwich, and has discovered some interesting farming history during his work. I thought it would be interesting to follow the Leslie Patterson family and the Andrew Backus family through the census records to watch a developing farm from the earliest through to the 1871 census. I've added in that information to Collins' research. Information has been gathered about townships in Ontario since the early 1800s. Most of these records have had personal names extracted and indexed for genealogical research. However, it seems that very little has been done on the agricultural side. For Dunwich, there is some basic information from 1817, 1818, and 19 regarding population, which went from 147 people in 1817 to 288 in 1819. By 1829, there were 516 occupants, and we get our first glimpse at the state of agriculture in the township. Thomas Talbot was the first settler and started clearing his property in 1803. By 1829, 2,642 acres had been cleared in the entire township. There were a total of 52 horses, three years and older, in the township, along with 144 oxen, 231 milk cows, and 209 horned cattle two to four years old. Clearly, oxen were most used for the challenging work of removing trees and stumps, clearing land, and harvesting crops. In 1835, the population had grown to 616, and there were 2,864 acres of land cleared. There were 66 horses three years and older in the township, along with 149 oxen, 237 milk cows, and 185 horned cattle two to four years old. In 1840, the population was just a little bit bigger at 633, and just a little bit more of the land was cleared at 3,196 acres. There were 112 horses three years and older, along with 136 oxen, 259 milk cows, and 221 horned cattle two to four years old. Let's talk about the 1842 census. The first province-wide census was held in 1842. About 120 heads of household are listed for Dunwich. And this census gives a more detailed look at what was happening in our township. These census records survive, and we can see what each farmer was doing. The census gives total acres occupied by each family, and then the acres of improved land. There were 3,172 acres of improved land in the township. The produce of crops was listed, and the number of livestock. In addition, the number of hives of bees was listed along with pounds of maple sugar produced. Not maple syrup, maple sugar. Finally, the pounds of wool procured and the yards of cloth manufactured by each family are listed. 
Thomas Talbot had the most land cleared and the most livestock. However, the Leslie Patterson household produced a total of 343 yards of cloth from their flock of 84 sheep. More about them in a minute. In 1842, the major crop was wheat, with potatoes a close second. Other major crops raised include oats, peas, and Indian corn. There was limited production of barley, rye, and buckwheat, though. The top producers of wheat were Anthony Crane, at 400 bushels, Archibald Graham, 300, Daniel McGugan, also 300, Joshua Bobier, 280 bushels, Stephen Backus, 250, and Leslie Patterson, also at 250 bushels. Most families produced maple sugar, but only 11 had beehives. John Wilson had 27 hives, which was about a quarter of the hives in the entire township. Joshua and John Bobier had a total of 35 hives. Now let's talk about the Leslie Patterson farm. He received 200 acres originally from Thomas Talbot in 1809 when he arrived. By 1842, Leslie, his wife Lydia, and their eight children had a total of 323 acres. Now 190 of those were cultivated and 133 weren't. Those acres were still probably covered in forest. For crops, the Pattersons grew 250 bushels of wheat, 60 of oats, 100 of Indian corn, and 150 bushels of potatoes. They were feeding 10 people, of course. Now, their livestock at the time consisted of 19 neat cattle, and that means they had either oxen or heifers. They had seven horses and 84 sheep. Now, they needed that in many sheep because the women of the family were producing 30 yards of cotton linen or another thin cloth, 313 yards of flannel or other woolen cloth not fulled, and 350 pounds of wool. Now, fulling that I just mentioned, that's a process that increases the thickness and the compactness of the wool by subjecting it to moisture, heat, friction, and pressure until it shrinks about 10 to 25%. Now, their neighbors and family members, Andrew Backus, he inherited his land, and some of it was already cultivated at the time, and he inherited it from his grandmother, Mary Story. So in 1842... Andrew and his wife, Mary Jane Hamilton, had two children under the age of two. 50 acres were cultivated, and 110 were uncultivated, and they had a total of 160 acres. They grew wheat, 50 bushels, 5 bushels of rye, 30 of oats, 30 of peas, 80 of Indian corn, and 50 bushels of potatoes. Now, they were only feeding four people. They also brought in 60 pounds of maple sugar. And for livestock, they had 10 neat cattle, 3 horses, 16 sheep, and 7 hogs. 40 yards of flannel or other woolen cloth, not fulled, and 40 pounds of wool were produced by Mary Jane Backus. Information from this census has been transcribed onto an Excel spreadsheet for analysis by the West Elgin Genealogical and Historical Committee and staff at Backus Page House Museum. The 1851 to 8 1852 census was taken in 1851, but the details recorded for Dunwich have been lost. There were a total of 264 occupiers of land. Cultivated land was 9,903 acres, with 6,369 acres of those being in crops, 3,354 acres pasture, and 180 acres of gardens. We can only get totals for the crops, the livestock, and some produce. In this census, some additional information was gathered. In 1842, only improved land area was given. In 1851, this was subdivided into under crops, under pasture, and gardens. Turnips, clover, carrots, mango wurzel, which is a type of beet, beans, hops, flax, hay, and tobacco were added crops. Have you listened to episode 20 on the tobacco industry yet? Acreages of crops and bushels of production were given. Production of cider, butter, cheese, beef, and pork are also included. And cattle were subdivided into milk cows, calves or heifers and bulls, oxen or steers. But beehives weren't included in the census for the 50s. Let's move on to 1861, where another census was taken. Fortunately, all the records for this census have been microfilmed and are available online through Library and Archives Canada. These census records provide us with the name of the occupier and the concession and lot held by each person or family. The land is broken down into under cultivation, under crops in 1860, 
under pasture in 1860, under orchards or gardens, and under wood or wild. The cash value of the farm in dollars and the cash value of farming implements or machinery is also given for each farm. Acres in production for fall wheat, spring wheat, barley, rye, peas, oats, buckwheat, Indian corn, potatoes, turnips, and again mango wurzel are provided. Production of carrots, beans, hops, hay, clover seed, and flax or hemp is included. And other products include wool, maple sugar, cider, fold cloth, which again is a step in woolen cloth making, which involves the cleansing of cloth to eliminate oils, dirt, and other impurities and to make it thicker. And then linen, flannel, butter, cheese, beef, and pork. The produce of orchards and gardens was given in dollars. Livestock covered bulls or oxen over three years of age, milk cows, horses over three years of age with their dollar value, colts or fillies under three years of age, sheep, pigs, and then the total value of livestock. This is invaluable information for historians. An interesting addition was a category for pleasure carriages kept and their value. Meredith Kahn had a carriage valued at $200. As a comparison, the cash value of 50 acres of woods was $400 at the time. The Leslie Patterson farm produced 3,000 pounds of cheese in 1860, which by far was the largest producer of cheese in the entire township. So let's find out more about the Patterson farm. So 18 years after the last census, unfortunately, Leslie Patterson has passed away. He passed away in 1852. So Mrs. Lydia Patterson is listed as head of the household. Lydia has five daughters and a granddaughter living with her, plus one Walter Patterson, age 13, who's listed as a laborer, and I'm unsure of what relation he is to the family. Daniel Hooley is listed as a laborer, age 16, and Archibald Duncan is listed as a teacher of music, and he seems to be visiting the Patterson family or someone nearby during the census because his regular residence is listed as not known. But two years later, Archibald marries youngest daughter, Lydia, and takes over the whole farm. Now, in 1861, they have a total of 323 acres still, but there's 100 cultivated, 34 under crops, 58 under pasture, 8 under orchards or gardens, and 123 are under wood or it's still wild. And their cash value for the entire farm is $3,870. The cash value of all their farming implements and machinery is $100. Now we can see exactly how many acres they have planted in different crops and how many bushels that they're getting from each of those crops. So fall wheat, they planted 10 acres and it got 188 bushels. Spring wheat was 4 acres at 23 bushels. Oats, 5 acres and 160 bushels. Indian corn is 11 acres and they got 40 bushels. Potatoes is an acre and they got 50 bushels. So you can see here that they've decreased how much they're growing in potatoes. And I would assume that that means that they have other food accessible to them and they're not surviving on just basics like a potato. They're also growing carrots now and get 50 bushels of carrots. They have hay and there's 20 bundles, which are 16 pounds a piece at least. And then the women have produced 130 pounds worth of wool from the sheep that they have and 200 pounds of maple sugar. So we know that they are tapping trees in the spring and collecting syrup and then turning it into maple sugar. So let's look at their livestock. They have steers or heifers under three years of age and there's 16 of them. They also have 16 milk cows. They have two horses over the age of three and the value of those two horses is $135. They have two colts or fillies under three years of age and 47 sheep. So they have a total of $990 worth of livestock. They produce 700 pounds of butter and 3,000 pounds of cheese. They have beef in barrels of at least 200 pounds per barrel and they have five of those. So clearly they're starting to eat more meat and probably they're selling some of the beef as well. They also have barrels of pork in 200 pound increments and they've got four of those. And perhaps this is why in the census, there's no pigs on their farm. They have a pleasure carriage valued at $100 and they're producing $40 of produce from their orchards and gardens. Now in the same year, we have Andrew and Mary Jane Backus and now they have seven children age 18 down to age three. 
and they've increased their holdings to 400 acres. So that's an additional 240 acres they've added in 18 years. 60 acres are under cultivation, 30 are under crops, 28 are under pasture, three acres now are orchards or gardens, and 340 acres of their holdings are wood or wild. But they have a cash value of $3,140. $50 is their cash value for their farming implements or machinery. Now let's see what crops they were getting. So fall wheat, they have 12 acres, which yielded 144 bushels. Spring wheat was two acres for 20 bushels. They did plant barley. They did plant rye, which was five acres, and they got 70 bushels. Peas were eight acres, 20 bushels. Oats, three acres, 60 bushels was their yield. Buckwheat, three acres, 67 bushels. Indian corn, three acres for 60 bushels. And the potatoes, two acres, and they got 60 bushels of potatoes. They had turnips, an acre of those, for 150 bushels, and they didn't plant mango warts. They did have hay, and they got two bundles of 16 pounds each. Now, Mary Jane did have wool um, from the sheep, and it was 167 pounds, and she also made 75 yards of flannel. They also tapped maple trees and ended up with 150 pounds of maple sugar, but they must have had apple trees in their orchard because they have 500 gallons of cider. Let's look at the livestock at the Bacchus farm. There's one bull or oxen over three years of age, 10 steers or heifers under three years of age, four milk cows, five horses over three years of age, and those horses are valued at $325. There's two colts or fillies under three years of age, 40 sheep, and 9 pigs, and the total value of all the livestock for the Bacchus family is $575. Now with those 4 milk cows, the family was able to produce 250 pounds of butter, and they've got one barrel of pork that equals about 200 pounds. They also had a pleasure carriage, and it was $50 in value. And the produce of their orchards and gardens was a $20 value. Now that doesn't include the 500 gallons of cider. Information on the 1861 census has been transcribed onto an Excel spreadsheet for further analysis by the committee and the museum staff. Let's look at 1871. This is the last one for which records on individual farms exist. The format for this census differed in that there were a number of schedules used to collect information. Schedule 1 is the nominal return of the living and contains mostly personal information. And that's the one that you're most likely to see if you use Family Search or Ancestry or any of the online Family Tree Maker products. Schedule 3 is the return of public institutions, real estate, vehicle, and implements. It provides the number of acres owned and the number of barns and stables. There's also a list of carriages, boats, plows, and cultivators horse rakes, threshing machines, and fanning mills. Schedule four is the return of cultivated land, of field products, and of plants and fruits. This is similar to the previous agricultural censuses. Schedule five covers livestock, animal products, homemade fabric and furs, and includes butter and cheese production and hives of bees. Schedule seven is the return of products of the forest. One of the challenges in extracting information from this census for individual farms is that the occupant names are only provided on Schedule 1. All other schedules reference a line page and a line number from Schedule 1, so an index will need to be provided. Information on the 1871 census is currently being transcribed onto an Excel spreadsheet by Colin McGugan as this project is ongoing, so I don't have the information yet for the Patterson and the Bacchus families as we've been following them along. The 1881 census and later censuses, when records were microfilmed in 1955, unfortunately the originals were destroyed. Only Schedule 1 was microfilmed, and so the records of agricultural production on individual farms has been lost. From all of this information, you can figure out the yield per acres of each crop for the census year. You can figure out how many milk cows it takes to produce a certain amount of butter or cheese, and more. So I hope that this podcast has piqued your interest in looking at the census records for yourself, especially the schedules pertaining to farming. Please join us next week for episode 23, which you can use as an audio guide to tour some of our local cemeteries. Thank you for listening.
please share the podcast with your friends and follow us on all social media platforms at Bacchus Page House. The Bacchus Page House Museum and Turconnell Heritage Society acknowledges the land we are on today as the traditional territory of First Nations people, the Attawandaron, and the Iroquois. As settlers at a settler-focused museum, we value both the significant historical and contemporary contributions of all original peoples and ask how we can be supportive in Indigenous cultural renewal. Life in the Talbot Settlement is a production of Turconnell Heritage Society, operators of Bacchus Page House Museum, funded by the Department of Canadian Heritage. Your host has been Angela Bobier. Music provided by Jack Whitmer. Thanks to our producer, Caitlin Reedsma. To make a charitable donation and to contact the Bacchus Page House Museum, visit our website, www.bacchuspagehouse.ca. And thank you for listening.